I believe it is a disgrace that a member of the British House of Commons should go before the United States Senate subcommittee and not testify, but decline to testify, and to insult all those who try to ask him questions with the most vile and cheap gutter snipe abuse. I think that's a disgrace. It is not just a disgrace, it is a crime. He has profited from the theft of money from the Iraqi oil for food program, has told continuous lies about his profiteering from it and the foul associates that he made at a time when Iraqi children were dying and 11 billion from this program, 11 billion, went to the murderer and criminal and sadist and fanatic Saddam Hussein. So how can anyone who's a business partner of this regime show their face in a city like this and not content with it? Not content with it. Not content with it, he turns up in Damascus. The man's search for a tyrannical fatherland never ends. The Soviet Union's let him down. Albania's gone. The Red Army's out of Afghanistan and Czechoslovakia. The hunt persists. Saddam has been overthrown, and his criminal connections with him have been exposed. But on to the next, on the 30th of July, in Damascus, in Syria, appearing, I've given it all to you in a piece of paper, in front of Mr. Assad, whose death squads are cutting down the leaders of democracy in Lebanon, as this is going on, to tell the Syrian people they're fortunate to have such a leader. The slobbering Dothan, who they got because he's the son of the slobbering tyrant of them before him. How anyone with a picture of socialist principle can act or speak in this way is beyond me, and I hope, ladies and gentlemen, far beyond you and far beneath your contempt. To hear him speak, you would think, would you not, that he was a pacifist, that he defines himself as anti-war. Now, how can this be said in good conscience by someone who has just, standing by the side of the dictator of Syria on the 30th of July, referred to the 154 heroic operations conducted in Iraq by the so-called resistance, a resistance that's run, as we know, by a senior bin Ladenist and by many of the former secret police of the Ba'athist regime. How can someone say, and say they're anti-war and they care about casualties, that they praise 154 operations a day? 145. I ask you. 145. He's coming down a bit. Um, no, that's what it says it's, not that ma it's not that many. It says 145 let me, in let me, your let me, let, me let me remind you what some of those operations were. Uh, the blowing up by military-grade explosives of the headquarters of the United Nations in Baghdad, a few months after the intervention, as it was being tenanted by Sergio Dimiello, one of the great international civil servants of our time, who was fresh from, Amy knows more about this than I, but fresh from his role in the very belated supervision of the independence of East Timor from Indonesia and uh, the holding of a free election in East Timor. And the jihadists who murdered him put out a communique saying, we have today put an end to the life of this disgusting man because he freed Timor from Muslim Holy Land in Indonesia. These people are not pacifists, ladies and gentlemen, nor are they anti-imperialists. If you haven't noticed, they call for the restoration of a lost empire, the caliphate, and the imposition of Sharia law on all non-believers within its borders. That's not pacifism. That's not anti-imperialism. And to praise the people who do this... is truly revolting. It's almost as funny as Michael Moore saying that the, the Zakawiite resistance in Iraq is for him the same as the Minutemen of the American Revolution. There comes a point, and I think it's come by now, where what people say is self-discrediting requires no more comment from me. Now, among the people killed by these heroic operations in Iraq, some of them run from Syria and paid for by the human toothbrush and slobbering Dauphin Assad, Mr. Galloway's new pal, among the victims of these, of these operations was specialist Casey Sheehan, who was trying to clean up the festering slum of what had once been called Saddam City and was now known to us as Sada City, where the water supply is coming back on. It's taking a while because people keep blowing it up, but it's coming back on. Now, I will put a simple moral proposition to you and see if I've phrased it aright. Is it not rather revolting to appear in Damascus by the side of our side and to praise the people who killed Casey Sheehan? Shame on you. Shame on you for saying that. Now, uh, if you examine the record of the so-called anti-war movement in this country and imagine what would have happened 
had its counsel been listened to over the last 15 and more years, you would have a world in which the following would be the case. Saddam Hussein would be the owner and occupier of Kuwait. He would have succeeded in the annexation, not merely the invasion, but the abolition of an Arab and Muslim state that was a member of the Arab League and of the United Nations. And with these resources, as we now know, because he lost that war, he was attempting to equip himself with the most terrifying arsenal that it was possible for him to lay his hands on. That's one consequence of anti-war politics. That's what would have happened. In the meanwhile, Slobodan Milosevic would have made Bosnia part of a greater Serbia, and Kosovo would have been ethnically cleansed and also annexed. Uh, the Taliban would be still in power in Afghanistan if the anti-war movement had been listened to, and Al-Qaeda would still be their guests. And Saddam Hussein, with his crime family, would still be privately holding ownership over a terrorized people in a state that's been most aptly, aptly described as a concentration camp above ground and a mass grave underneath it. Now, if I had that record politically, I would be extremely modest. I wouldn't be demanding explanations from those of us who said it's about time that we stop this continual capitulation to dictatorship, to racism, to aggression, and to totalitarian ideology, that we will not allow to be repeated in Iraq the failures in Rwanda and in Bosnia and in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And we take pride in having taken that position, and we take pride in our Iraqi and Kurdish friends who are conducting this struggle. But while you're masturbating in that manner, the Iraqi secular left, the socialist and communist movements, the workers' movement, the trade unions, are fighting for their lives against the most vicious and indiscriminate form of fascist violence that any country in the region has seen for a very long time. And the full intent of that the full intent of that was, and I'll say it to it, yes, yes in Fallujah, was to establish a Taliban regime and, and, a, and a safe house for Al-Qaeda. That's what we were facing. You think you could fight that without casualties? You're irresponsible. You're ahistorical. We take, on this side of the house, without conditions, we take our side with the struggle of the Iraqi democratic and secular left against fascism. We make no apology. Those who have betrayed their own party, Mr. Galloway, had to be expelled from the great labor movement of which I was, I'm myself still a member, uh, because of advocating the shooting, publicly advocating jihad against British troops, now turns on the Iraqi left and wishes them well, as they, as, and wishes and argues and hopes for their defeat by an onslaught which would make Afghanistan uh, seem like a civilized country. What two positions can one take about this, I invite you to consider, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Galloway claims that at a certain period in the 1980s, he was supporting uh, Iraqi Democrats and uh, protesting against Saddam Hussein, knowing what he was capable of, knowing what he had done, knowing the genocide, for example, committed in, in uh, Kurdistan, and knowing of the aggressions and the chemical weaponry that had been deployed um, in Iran. He says he knows that. I've had the opportunity to check with the woman, Anne Cluid, a just very distinguished member of the Labour left in the British Parliament, who was the chairman of the relevant organization, the Campaign for the Restoration of Democratic Rights in Iraq, she says she has no memory of Mr. Galloway's participation, but let's say that we take his word for it. It means that when he went, having said that he thought that Kuwait was part of the Iraqi motherland, to greet Saddam Hussein in 1994 in Iraq and to salute him for his courage That's and his interfatic ability. You're lying again. His, uh, Your nose me, is growing. He went, he went and, and, to, and to take his side again, it meant that he went in foot on his own evidence. He went in full knowledge of the fact that he was dealing with a murderer and a monster and a dictator. So the, the pit of exculpation that you attempt to dig, uh, Mr. Galloway, has just uh, swallowed you up, and the record will show it. Yeah. Point to something that you had done to help build up the new Iraq. Point to something that you were doing to help the Iraqi women's organizations, who indeed do have to combat fundamentalism. Point to something you had done to help unearth the mass graves uh, and console the relatives of those who were found in them. Point to something to you, could, you had yourselves contributed to the, to the emancipation of Kurdistan. You could, or something perhaps to help the new Iraqi press and media acquire some more modern equipment on which to conduct this debate. Why don't you think of the possible nobility of that alternative? Because to offer your solidarity instead to the 154 operations that are sabotaging what this new process is to be, is to be, I think, hopelessly covered in shade.